जी काम तो नहीं है ना तो मैंने यूज़ किया है हाँ तो वो तो लोग लोग बोल के काम किया है Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I warmly welcome all of you gathered here today for the session titled Science of Docker and Kubernetes. To kickstart this event, I would like to invite Professor K.P. Hewagamage, the Director of University of Colombo School of Computing, to address the gathering. Thank uh, you. Uh, very good evening to all of you. And uh, this is a kind of a new activity we started at the UCSC, uh, conducting a kind of an open seminar, public seminar, uh, whenever we have a visitor at UCSC uh, to update the knowledge and uh, the development in the computer science and information technology. So in this year, we got an, uh, a new speaker, and it is my duty before we invite him to uh, to present uh, uh, to deliver the, the speech uh, to introduce him. Dr. Rafiul Ahad uh, was an uh, assistant professor of the information systems at the University of Maryland at College of Park for four years. He has 20 years of experience in the software industry in the various roles, including software developer, architect development manager and software product executive at both Hewlett Packard and Oracle. Currently, he is the vice president of the software development in Oracle Corporation USA and a member of the board of directors at the Hallmatic Technologies, a Sri Lankan tech startup. So without further moving, I would like to invite Dr. Raful. So please come. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We will now move into the session, Science of Docker and Kubernetes, which will be conducted by Dr. Rafiul Ahad. 
Dr. Rafiul is the Vice President of Software Development at Oracle Corporation USA. He is also a member of the Board of Directors of Holmetic Technologies. He has published four peer-reviewed papers in prestigious academic journals and presented eight refereed papers in international conferences. He is currently involved in performance engineering of Oracle Service Cloud and migration to Kubernetes-based environment in Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. With that brief introduction, I'd like to invite Dr. Rafiul Ahad on stage to conduct the session. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm Rafiul Ahad. S uh, I have been introduced twice, so I don't need to introduce myself again anymore. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Docker and Kubernetes. And uh, uh, the, let me see if this works. <laughs> So this is a standard disclaimer. Uh, this presentation was prepared by me at my own time and um, does not necessarily reflect the uh, views of my employer or Oracle Corporation. Um, by the way, nothing I said I'm going to say here should be construed as trying to sell any product from any company. It's purely a technology uh, educational seminar. Okay. Um, this is the agenda. First, I'll talk about why we need uh, Docker and Kubernetes, right? What is the rationale for it? Then I'll talk about Docker features and Docker technology. Then I'll talk about the Kubernetes features, Kubernetes technology, and then we'll have some concluding remarks. Um, but I will not, I, I will transition my slide in such a way that sometimes you may not be related back to this agenda. But I hope uh, as we go along, uh, you get the idea about uh, the rationale for Docker and Kubernetes and the technologies used there. Uh, this slide I just showed, uh, just to let you know that the average server operates at about 12 to 18% of the capacity, right, in, in data centers. That means that much of the time, we are wasting the compute capacity because they are idle, right? And we want to make that more efficient. We want to make that more efficient so that we can have higher density of compute uh, containers in a, uh, in a machine, right? And so before I start, let me just give you a very high level uh, goal. At the end of the day, we want to minimize the cost of providing services, right? to customers or multiple tenants. Uh, that, will, that will meet the service level agreement. Every, every service provider will sign with the customer some kind of service, le service level agreement where they agree on quality of service, such as you know, the minimum response time, right? minimum availability. Yeah, your system should be up and running 99.999% of the time, and so on. right? And, and you, you, pr you give those guarantees for a certain workload, right? There's a certain workload that you uh, anticipated workload. Now, what is the cost that they are trying to minimize? 
The cost that they are trying to minimize consists of two parts, the, the ca capital expense and operating expense. Capital expense are things like, you know, the space for your data center, the uh, hardware cost and others, right? I, and I've highlighted hardware cost there because I'm going to come to that. And the op operating expenses are human labor cost, software licenses, op powers, and things like that. So those are the two categories of cost, right? And what I am claiming, and based on the evidence, is that Docker can lower the hardware cost by being more efficient in hardware resource usage, right? And Kubernetes, it is more efficient than uh, even virtual machines. Virtual machines, in initially, when the, when the bare metal servers were very u lowly utilized, right, we started using virtual machines and put n a number of them in the uh, bare metal machine, and that raised um, the utilization quite a bit, right? And now, uh, it's, uh, Docker is even more, uh, efficient than virtual machines. And Kubernetes, uh, sometimes I re refer to Kubernetes as K8F, just because I have not enough space on the slide to put the spell the name. So Kubernetes brings down the labor cost by automating many tasks performed by human being, right? And you will see that as we go along. More so than, uh, there are other technologies like Apache Mesos and Nomad, Nomad that also does things that Kubernetes does, right? Scheduling uh, which container should go to which um, uh, machine and uh, things like that. Uh, but Kubernetes has become more popular lately uh, and because it's also promoted by uh, a lot of uh, big companies. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about the reason we need, uh, we want to use Docker and Kubernetes through a little story that I'll build up, and in the process, I'll ask questions. The questions are only for students, and the student who answer the question correctly gets a mug with the Docker and Kubernetes logo on it, right? If multiple students want to answer the question, it's my choice to pick who will answer the question, right? And if uh, the person answers it wrong, I don't get a mug from them, but, I <laughs> you know, but, but the person who answers it right will get the mug. Now, assume that you are in a banking application that uses the following three applications, right? The first one is account management. Now, clearly, you can argue with me saying that this is not how we do it anymore, but bear with me because this is the example that I'm going to use, right? So it may not be the way you do things today, but it actually will highlight some of the points uh, that I want to make. So you have an account management um, uh, application which will create account check balances, browse transaction uh, history. And then you have transactions uh, application which allows you to deposit, withdraw, or transfer funds, right? And then you have a credit card application which pay balance, dispute charges, uh, and so on. Then, uh, again, I'm gonna make a few assumptions so that my uh, example is strong. And that is, let's say each of them was developed by a software development team and each was developed for Linux and uses C language, right? Linux is important here because I'm gonna to come to, uh, you'll see very soon. And it listens to uh, TCP, uh, TCP IP traffic on a certain port, port number 8080. They all decided to listen on that port, right? And it writes logs to var log directory, right? And uh, uses free memory cache. For, uh, every application is written such a, in such a way that it will grab all the free memory and create a, a cache for itself, right? Uh, I'm building up the story, uh, bear with me a little bit, and, uh, and then it connects to the same database using possibly different versions of the database client library, right? Now you have these three applications ready to go. You want to deploy it, and you want to let your users use it, right? So let's look at some deployment options. What choices do you have? You can have one or two physical server machine per application. Why do we need two? That's the first question. Who can answer? Why do we need two? Come on, you can do better than this. There must be someone who will. A, a student can answer that question and get a mug for free, a coffee mug for free. No, no taker? For availability reason, right? Because if, uh, you, you want to answer? No, okay. So that means that if, if you have one only, 
right? And it fails, you, are, uh, you, you have an outage. If you have two, if the probability of one failing is P, another student question, what's the probability of both failing at the same time? Come on, this is math question, you should be able to answer. Statistics, probability. Are you shy or what? <laughs> Come. It's uh, P squared, right? P times B, right? If P is zero point zero zero one, you can see P squared will be point zero zero five of them with one, right? So the probability of both failing goes down quite a bit. That's the reason we have, high, for high availability, we have redundancy. That's the reason, right? Now, so, or you can do one virtual machine per application, right? And I think many of you know vi what virtual machines are, right? So virtual machine will allow each application to run in its isolated uh, uh, resource environment, right? Doesn't interfere with other virtual machines running on the same machine. So they are well, well isolated. It's less cost because now you can deploy, uh, uh, you know, you have two machines. In each machine, you have three applications and three VMs. Right? You have lower cost because you now need only two machines, and you have uh, availability is the same. There are two VMs running uh, the same application in two different machines. You don't want to run two VMs of the same application in the same machine, then you would have defeated the purpose. Right? You want to run it on different machines so that your availability is better. Now, the, now I'm saying that can we deploy all those three applications on the same machine? We can. Can we deploy all those applications on the same machine? Hmm? Uh, yeah, okay, what's the first problem? Same boat. He gets a coffee mug. Right? So the, th the reason is that these guys were written in such a way that they're using the same resource, right? Network uh, conflict, four. You, you get one more chance. What other conflicts there are there? Uh, it is true that one, one of them can grab all the memory and the other two will starve, right? Also, they're using the same file system. They're both writing to var log, correct? And then they will ju just uh, step on each other's toe because the same file system, correct? And why is that? That's because uh, it's not isolated. They're all using the same namespace in Linux, correct? So to address the network port file, uh, file conflicts, use separate namespaces. The, the real word is kernel namespace, and I'll come to get in that. Huh? So, but, uh, and, and the command that you can use is unshare. I'll let you figure out a little later. But what we're trying to do is, when you spawn off a process through clone or things like that, you will say that process should run in its own namespace. There are many namespaces there, so you can say, okay, it, its own network namespace, its own mount namespace, right? And therefore, this process almost entirely becomes PID namespace. This process becomes PID zero. It's a root of uh, PID one, a root of the, uh, uh, the uh, hierarchy, right? And then uh, you still have one more problem, and that is one process can chew up all the resources, right? Memory, CPU, and, uh, and the other two can starve, right? And I think if I ask this question, somebody is bound to get the, what is the technology used to make sure that a process doesn't use more than what is allocated to it in terms of resources. You have the answer on the whiteboard, on the board, and by answering that, you get a coffee mug. It's the control groups, right? Linux has this concept of control groups, so, and you assign resources to the control group. Let's say this control group should get uh, two CPU cores, right, and 16 gigabyte of memory and you can start putting processes into the control group, and all those processes cannot use more than the resources allocated to the group, right? And you can, there's nothing preventing you from putting one process into one group. So you create a group specifically for that process, and you put the process ID into that group, and that, uh, that process is now constrained by the resources uh, assigned to that group. Yeah? So the second concept of Linux, right? And, the, and then you can create one directory by application. Um, basically, what I'm saying is that you will have a, a one mount space per application. Uh, it's called change root or cheroot, right? So that that application sees the slash as its root, when in fact slash is not the root of the actual uh, tree, right? It's actually the, we are allowed to see them that 
subdirectory SS root. So he is never aware of something else there. So he, is, he can create slash var slash log in his own namespace and not conflict with somebody else's var log namespace, right? And then it is this, this, this deployment scheme is actually better than the previous two, right? Because in the previous VM case, and I will come to that a little later, each application has its own copy of the operating system running in VM, including the kernel. In this case, the same operating system is shared by everyone, right? You don't have the operating system overhead, right? And therefore, if you do this, you can pack more of these applications into the same machine, right? Uh, m more so than VMs, right? Now, so I talked about uh, uh, Linux uh, process isolation. Uh, the first one is kernel namespaces. These are some of the namespaces that we can use, right? Uh, let me see. If I click the wrong button, I might get into. So for example, the C group is, uh, you can create a namespace for C group so that uh, the C group root hierarchy is defined for that one. You can have network so that the same ports can be used. The same port number can be used in different uh, namespaces. Uh, you can have a mount point like uh, change root and things like that. You, have, you can have a process ID tree. You can have a user and group and so on. So these are the namespaces, kernel namespaces uh, that uh, Linux provides. And then, and how about the, um, um, the Linux feature for constraining the resource? It's the control group that I talked about earlier, right? It's a Linux kernel feature which allows processes to be organized into hierarchical group, right? And whose usage of various resources can be limited and monitored. You can actually use C groups to also monitor the resources used by those processes, right? Now, uh, there are two, two versions of C group. What I'm gonna talk about mostly is version two of C group, right? There are pros and cons behind that and things like that, uh, but uh, the, the resource limit is defined for the group, right? And you can only put processes in the root, uh, in the uh, leaf level groups, right? Uh, it, it's a group tree hierarchy. The middle ones cannot have processes assigned to them in version two. Only the, uh, only the leaf nodes you can assign. But nothing prevents you from uh, creating a C group for one process and assigning that. In fact, Docker does that. Right? When, you, when you start Docker and you specify the resource for that Docker container, it uses uh, a C group to do that. Uh, I'll come to that, by the way. And some of the resources that you can limit right, for a process to use includes a CPU, uh, the share of CPU, and it, that one kicks in only when the system is busy. If the system is not busy, uh, the uh, processes can use the CPU. right? Uh, when it is busy, we, it starts limiting who gets what uh, um, to make it more uh, equitable sharing of the resources. And the memory limits, are, uh, limits and reports uh, the process, kernel, and swap memory for a group. And I.O. control, which limits and access the specified block devices, right? And so this is not exhaustive. There, there are a few more uh, you know, uh, resources that you can constrain. Now, so for example, in our application, I might have a hierarchy like this, right? Uh, it says that, okay, in this group, app one, I will, oh, by the way, this is actually a file system, yeah, C group file system, right? And this is a, these are directories, and these are files. So if you assign the, some value, let's say uh, 200 GB into high memory, this file, it actually limits the group's uh, usage to 200, right? And I'm assuming this is the leaf level uh, uh, directory. So I can, I, can put, uh, I can start the process, put its process ID into this group, and therefore that process is now bound by the, 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 the resources allocated to the group, right? So we can do that for app two and app three. Now we, I have make, uh, now I can make sure that each one app will not uh, consume all the resources and, and make other, other, other two stuff, right? By picking these values here correctly. Not only that, you don't have to pick all the same value, right? You can give application one is more important and used heavily, so I'll give you uh, two thirds of the resources and then I share the remaining one third among the other two, right? That, that's also possible. Okay, so we're getting to a point where, wow, I can 
just have a process in its own kernel namespace, right? Has a, a process has its own kernel namespace and C group, and I have an isolated environment, right? But actually, in practice, it's not that easy to do. You have to learn a lot of Linux commands and things like that, right? So because of that, we have uh, something called a Linux container. An example is LXC. It's a Linux container. That one will uh, put together all of these various features of Linux, right, and create something called the container. It's a generic form of the container. And it will use the kernel namespace, uh, you know, and the security related things, you know, including the capabilities, and it'll use C group, right? And the LXE, L LXE containers are somewhere in between, uh, in the industry, sometimes a, a good practice, uh, the, the, uh, one practice in industry is to uh, do just a change route and have the application only see that uh, uh, file system and install its binary there and run it, right? And that's very lightweight, right? But uh, LXC is a little bit more heavy than that because it has a lot, a, a few more things. And, um, uh, but it is not as heavy as a VM. The VM is much more isolated because every uh, VM has its own operating system in it, right? Whereas LXC uh, is using the same operating system, the host operating system, right? Now, here's a diagram that can uh, clear up a few things. So if this is a physical machine, right, uh, and if you're using a, a, high, a, a virtualization technology called Xen, right, then that Xen hypervisor will sit right on top of the physical machine, right, and then each VM has its own copy of operating system, including the kernel objects. This is the one thing good about this, uh, this system is that these operating systems can be different. You can have a Windows running here, you can have Linux running here, right? You can have some other operating system running there. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at the containers, there is only one operating system, and the kernel, uh, you know, the process tree, the NIC, the mount points are all shared. Each container has a view of this. You know, this little triangle is a view in of this big triangle. This little circle is a view of this one, and this square is a view of this one. So they are, they are divvying up the resources here and seeing it from, prospect, uh, uh, from the process uh, and thinking that this is the only resource available for them, right? And you will, you will see that uh, I have only one kernel, right? And the kernel is being shared by these processes. Here, I have m multiple kernels right, and the operating system. One thing good is this, this is more isolated, right? Uh, these are not shared, um, but it's more heavy. And this is less isolated, right, uh, lightweight. Uh, and the biggest, the biggest issue here is not knowing, uh, b because of this namespace and all, uh, all access to the kernel has to be qualified by the namespace or other identities so that they don't get mixed up. And the, the biggest problem is not knowing if all of the access uh, path to the kernel has been secured or not. Is there some that is not secured that somebody can exploit and go in and use, right? So, um, what else should I say? Oh, uh, so this one has, uh, uh, is isolated so that, uh, you know, there is no, th th uh, there's a bit more security on this uh, for the VM, but, but, the, uh, but the, uh, efficiency wise, it's no comparison, right? Uh, so for example, uh, the OS containers such as Alexi, they're, they're, they're more efficient, more efficient use of host resources, therefore you can have higher density of containers running on a, on a uh, server. If you look at this, you will see that, uh, that this is a KVM, right? Uh, one more coffee mug question. Uh, what is a uh, KVM? You just have to say what, it, uh, what the K and V and M mean. Hmm? Kernel? Kernel virtualization, basically it's a type two virtualization whereby KVM, the hypervisor is on top of an operating system, right? Linux operating system. 
and it used some kind of uh, QE and quick emulation mode for devices and things like that, but it can use the CPU and memory directly from that operating system. It's a, it is a little bit, in my mind, better right, uh, than the, uh, the Zen operating system because it's actually based on uh, one operating system running and then on top of that, a type two hypervisor us using quick emulation. So the KVM, uh, still, you can see the footprint is quite high, right? Uh, wh whereas the uh, LXC footprint is very low, right? So uh, basically you can pack many more uh, 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 containers uh, in, in, the, uh, in the same machine that uh, compared to VM, right? And more, uh, so you can have more OS containers can be run on a bare metal server than VMs. And then better performance. Better performance means that, uh, look at the startup time difference, right? The, you can start up a Linux container w uh, under less than 50 milliseconds, right? Whereas uh, you need about 30 to 40, 45 seconds to start up a VM, right? And why is that important? It is important because if you're trying to do auto scaling and things like that, and you have to spin up uh, a container real quickly, uh, this is feasible, possible, right? In 50 milliseconds, you can spin up a container. But if you have to wait 30 to 45 seconds, right, that may not be a good idea, right? And then finally, uh, the, the performance, right? So uh, IO performance uh, is better for LXE uh, than for KVM. Now you came here to listen about Docker, and I'm, I have not reached Docker yet. I'm still talking about container and LXE and trying to convince you containers are good, right? That's because Docker is nothing more than a container with a few more technologies, right? And so, uh, but then uh, we'll say, but LXE is still difficult to use, right? Uh, you know, I still have to set up my own. Uh, virtual Ethernet uh, interface and uh, map it to the uh, host of uh, internet, install config uh, dependencies, application, because it's, it is empty, right? I need to still install the um, applications in it. So this is where Docker comes in. Docker is a platform for developers and sysadmins to develop, ship, and run applications which run in OS containers, right? It's basically uh, uses all of OS containers uh, features uh, and the major Docker features are the image management. You will be able to say that in this Docker container, I want this uh, binary to be running, right? I want this application, I want, and this application depends on this other application. All its dependencies can be packaged up, and then you create an image, and then you create a Docker container from that image, and the container will already have all of that binaries and its dependencies in it. Right? You don't have to go in and start pulling down uh, different pieces, hopefully correctly, right? Because this is, um, this, pack, th this image contains everything that you have tested already, right? Which version of dependent software and, uh, and so on. Even down to the level of user space binary li library for uh, Linux. So one can be running on Ubuntu, the other can be running on uh, Red Hat Linux, right? You, you still can do that. So. And then the image, uh, I'll show you a little picture later on how the image management is supported. And then runtime management. The runtime management uh, creates a containers, right? And then it supports many uh, format of containers. Uh, uh, it used to use LXE directly first, but now it has moved to its own uh, lib containers library. Um, and then when you create a container for Docker, you use a command called Docker run. And Docker Run will take a lot of parameters, including you know resource limit and things like that. So, so it's very easy to start. You know, you go if you want to in install MySQL, look for MySQL Docker image, right? Run it with whatever parameters you want to run it, and you get it, right? So this is uh, making. So if you look at this picture, you will see that on the client side, you can do Docker build to build the images. Docker pull to pull the image from the uh, registry and Docker run to start the container. Right? The container, you get a container only when you do Docker run, right? and the container is um, uh, created with the uh, file system that, I'll come to that later, file system uh, that has all your binary in it already, right? application and binary in it. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, uh, th th in the Docker machine, Docker host, you will see a, a Docker daemon running, and then 
uh, the clients communicate with it, right? And then it can pull down the images from Docker registry. Uh, once you have built the registry, you can actually push it to the registry. Uh, once you have built the image, right, you can push it to the registry so that others can download it from it, uh, pull it from it, and then uh, you do a Docker run so it starts a container, right? It's that simple. Now, um, what technologies uh, does Docker use? It's basically all of the technologies that we talked about in Linux kernel namespace and control groups. Uh, in fact, everything LXE supports, right? Docker can use that. Docker will use that. And in addition, it uses a union file system. This is, this started uh, when we used to have, when we, when we want to boot up an operating system from CDs, right? Usually you have to copy every, all the binary into your computer and then you boot up, right? And then, <coughs> In order to avoid that, they have something like a union file system where the CD is used to boot up everything, but if you write to it, they create another layer on top of it right, with the writable files, right? The same, uh, the same concept is carried over here. It's called the union file system, right? And the, in the union file system, uh, there, there are no, layers of files. The bottommost layer is read-only and can be shared by a lot of images, right? And then if you modify something there, it creates a, a copy on write, uh, a copy, which is called copy on write because you only copy that file when you write to it. <coughs> so, uh, th 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 this diagram shows, uh, for example, this lower layer is a uh, read-only file la uh, image layer. Right, and if you uh, if you write something, it creates a copy here in the middle layer. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> this particular one um, is the um, overlay file system that that uh, Docker uses. Right, so in the operating system level, there may be three uh, directories that are mounted. Right, the lower directory, upper directory, and merge directory. And Docker will make sure that the lower directory is used for the image, right? <coughs> and if you modify some files there, it creates this uh, files in this layer, and they can be viewed from the top layer, and you get the right one, right? So uh, this little diagram shows how Docker, uh, you how you create an image, how you create a container, right? So uh, first. This is your example Docker file. It, what it says is that I want to start from Ubuntu 15.04 image, right? <coughs> that doesn't mean I'm pulling together the kernel of Ubuntu, right? Um, it only means the binary and libraries, the user space element that you're pulling in. And you want to copy the slash app directory, you want to make and then command uh, run this one, right? So if you, if you take this Docker file and do a Docker build, right? then you get the image. Then you can push it to the uh, registry and then you can do a Docker run of the name of the image and you get the container running, right? It's that simple, right? And if you already have a, an image somewhere, then you don't even have to build it yourself. You just uh, uh, pull it and run, run the, um, uh, doc, uh, issue the Docker run command, it will create a container. Now, these are some of the commands used by uh, 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 that you can use in the Docker file, right? So you can uh, add uh, files, run, and things like that. So, so now you you see, okay, I can easily create uh, ap my application, package it up as an image, and I can create as many containers as I want anywhere I want from that image, right? F cool, right? Is that the end of your uh, problems in deploying application? No because you have a few more things to uh, take care of. You have many physical or virtual machines in your environment. How do you decide where I should put this Docker container in? Which machine, right? It's called scheduling, right? A placement of Docker uh, container on uh, one of the many machines that you have, right? The next thing is, how can I assure that incoming service requests are load balanced amongst the minimum of N Docker containers, right? So basically, uh, it comes under monitoring and corrective actions as well as, uh, you know, uh, clustering and things like that, right? So you still have to do those, right? 
And then how can I increase the number of Docker containers as the load increases, auto-scaling, right? You, you have to do it, right? You only have Docker. And how can, I serve it, uh, how can a service discover other services and start using it, service discoveries? And I can go on uh, a few more you know, problems that you have to deal with, right? Uh, so the Docker is not the, um, and it's a solution, but not the complete solution on anywhere near it. Uh, so to do these things, we have Kubernetes, right? What Kubernetes does is that, uh, I think I should, yeah. It's a deployment model and management, uh, uh, deployment model and management and runtime services to deploy Docker-centric services, right? And so it actually uh, allows you to manage Dockers, uh, uh, Docker images, how to package the, how, how to run them right, as, as, uh, as you provide microservices and things like that. So it has a few concepts. The first one is called the pod, right? A pod usually contains one main Docker container, which is your application, and, and several sidecar containers. So for example, some of them may be uh, doing some kind of um, um, so, the uh, circuit breaker and things like that, right? Sidecar containers, or uh, sidecar containers may also be collecting log files and sending up to the, uh, you know, uh, central log uh, uh, repository and things like that. Uh, but the pods don't have a permanent fixed IP address. They have ephemeral IP addresses, and they can be moved from one, uh, you know, machine uh, to another machine. Uh, and so, you need another concept to make sure that despite the pod getting different IP addresses and all, you can still use uh, any one of those pods by means of a service, which is a network object that has a VIP. Uh, so people familiar with uh, load balancer will know that a, a VIP is used uh, to basically aggregate several IP addresses that, that can load balance to, right? So uh, I you can take several pods and you can create a service and when you create a service, Docker, uh, Kubernetes also has another concept called labels. So you can provide labels to these uh, uh, objects and you can use some kind of predicate over labels to define the sets that should become uh, part of this uh, service. So you, you, when you create a service, you don't have to say, put this Docker container, put this Docker container and put this other one into the service. You just have to make sure that if the label is X, it becomes part of the service. Right? Or if the label is X, uh, 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 if X is equal to one and Y is equal to two, those X equal one is a label, Y equal to two is another label, then uh, if both of them are true, that pod becomes a member, right? So you can define a predicate based on the label for the membership of the pods into end service. Uh, it's not enumerated one, it's more like uh, based on predicate. And the deployment, which describes how a pod is to be deployed including replicas. I will need two copies of this at minimum, right? And sometimes with a horizontal port auto-scaling, you can also say minimum of two, maximum of seven, and things like that, right? You, you can say minimum two, maximum of seven, and the Docker will make, uh, Kubernetes will make sure that your number of ports never go, uh, never goes below, thank you, never goes below um, that minimum. So if you look at um, the various, uh, this is again not exhaustive, right? But uh, this diagram, I, I have to tell you that I forgot where it came from. It came from somewhere else. It's not my original uh, picture, but I cannot attribute it because I forgot so far. So you can see that um, a, a user can access multiple uh, Kubernetes services th uh, through the uh, load balancer, and each Kubernetes service may connect to one or more Kubernetes port, right? And that port can also call back to one or more Kubernetes services, right? It may connect to. And then uh, here, a cluster has, is made out of a one or more Kubernetes node, right? I'll come to this a little bit diagram a little later also. And a Kubernetes node inside there, you're having a Kubernetes port running there. And that port uh, has one or more Docker container in it, right? Like I said earlier. And it, the container will pull the image from the registry. Right? And then on this side, a Kubernetes deployment specifies zero or more replica set. And the replica set 
is controlled by a Kubernetes replication controller, and this one will become, this is an important concept in a Kubernetes, because this controller is the one making sure that when you specify certain number of copies of the pods, this is the one making sure that you always have that number of pods, right? And then a, a replica starts a number of pods here, right? And um, the controller will be monitoring. Um, uh, uh, I'll come to that a little later. Uh, so uh, if you want to deploy a Hello World application, this is your uh, you know, YAML file to do that. And that is uh, it's saying that what the version is, uh, the kind of object is deployment, or resource they call it. And the um, labels app is hello world, name is hello world, right? There are two labels that are specified here. And then uh, I need one replica, one copy of it, right? And so this is how you define uh, the um, uh, deployment and then you deploy it. Now this is a uh, YAML file for a pod and then uh, this, this command, kubectl or kubectl, is used to create, for example, if you say create dash, create f, uh, uh, port.yaml, and this is port.yaml, oh, oh shoot, okay. Uh, this is port.yaml, so it'll take this and create uh, the port based on that, right? And then you can get port and you'll see you can get some ports there. Okay, um, a Kubernetes environment consists of two things. One is called the control plane. Uh, the control plane, the big, uh, uh, the, 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 pr the prominent, uh, piece running there is the master, Kubernetes master node. And inside that master, oh wait. Uh, inside that master you have the, something called the API server, controller manager, scheduler, DNS, etc. right? And, and then there's a kubelet communication with the master uh, in each node, in each worker node. And then, and then you have data plane. In the data plane you have all the worker nodes onto which you will deploy your Docker containers uh, in, in the form of pods, right? Uh, the worker nodes are either bare metal or VM configured at Docker host, as Docker host. And Kubernetes defines the port to port, port to host, and host to host net network overlays, network communication, right? So if you look at it, you will see that the master node, right, uh, has the API server, controller manager, scheduler. This is the one that schedules the you know, uh, which port goes on which node, right? And then, and then you have the etcd. Uh, does anyone know what ed etcd is? Hmm? Key value, distributed key value store. He gets one uh, coffee mug. It's a distributed key value store so, so that uh, other nodes can just, um, uh, you know, write to it, right? And you, uh, uh, one node can write to it, another node can read from it, right? And not only that, you can watch the values change, right? You, you can keep, put a watch on it so that when the node appears, the node will register with etcd, right? And, uh, and someone else, for example, the, um, the replication controller may be listening to that event, it's called watching, Right? And it so sees that the port has come on, and it'll do something to make sure that it um, becomes part of the service. Right? This is how uh, things work here, because um, when, when, think, when some events happen, you can, uh, you can register it in the distributed key value store, right? and others can uh, subscribe to those events and listen and get it, and then do something about it. Right? So this is uh, the master node, and inside, in each node, you will see the pods running, right? And, uh, and then there's a network uh, uh, overlay layer there. So Kubernetes objects uh, consist of uh, the uh, control plane objects. Because Kubernetes supports REST API, those objects are also called resources, right? Because you refer to them as resources from outside. So control plane objects are known as resources, and there are two kinds of it. There are two kinds. The system defined such as the deployment and replica set that you just saw. But you can extend the Kubernetes system by defining your own objects, right? And own, uh, write your own controller, right? APIs and things like that. And those are called user defined uh, or custom resource definition, right? The most, most important thing is each of those objects has at least, right, 
two attributes. One is called the spec, which says the desired state. You, you want uh, the desired state. So earlier you said, I need two copies of this, uh, this port running, right? That's a desired state. And it also has a status field, which is the actual state, right? Actual state and a controller that has the logic to take from the actual state to the des desired state, right? And it's a control loop, it's always running. So <coughs> you can deploy a port, right? And you can um, uh, have labels for those uh, 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 containers in them and uh, for the port uh, themselves, and they'll be picked up appropriately by services, right? And create uh, and included in the service, right? Uh, so it's all done declaratively through this, uh, through the spec and, and the status, which are actual, and the controller, which takes, uh, which takes the system from the actual state to the desired state. Right? Now, uh, see, um, so Docker and Kubernetes have become technologies of choice for microservices-based application, right, and deployment in modern data center. Uh, that, that's the reason uh, we are talking about Dockers and containers, uh, Dockers and Kubernetes. Uh, there are some security concerns because Docker kernel is shared, right, by all containers running in the machine, and there may be some unauthorized path to the kernel, and I mentioned that earlier, right. And Kubernetes is still evolving uh, with some some features like horizontal port auto scaling, which basically is um, m uh, looking at some. Uh, events or metrics and things like that and decide to scale up and down, right? Uh, it's, uh, it's looking only at CPU and a few other things, not, not too uh, ex extensive yet. So container adoption and production role. So you will see that many people are uh, already uh, using or plan to use Kubernetes in actual uh, pr production deployments. Okay. Well, that's all I have. If you have any question, please feel free to ask. No question? We still have a coffee mug, right? Anyone who asks a question gets one. <laughs> uh, thank you very much.